All right, Outlaw Radio Live fans, we are live on the air with the legendary singer, producer, Mosey MD. How you doing tonight? Hey, hey, doing good. Doing good. So, I have to ask you, what made you decide to get into the music industry? Well, I, I really don't remember because it, it started before I could really recollect what was going on my parents when i was really young uh my energy with singing and performing and stuff and so they put me on stage at like five years old i was like ripping crowds <laughs> singing michael jackson and al green and and all that kind of stuff and then it was like you know i kept doing that for a few years and I think it was about seven or eight, and, and they noticed that my sister could sing and she could barely talk. And they were like, okay, we're going to California. And basically at that moment, they decided that they were going to groom us to be in the music industry. And we moved to Long Beach, and that was it. I mean, we just kept going from there. And your sister, man, she does have one hell of a good singing voice. Oh my gosh, yes. See, when I mm-hmm. when I actually got connected with her, because we have, as you already know, we have her coming up in a couple of days on the show as well. Um, yeah. When I, I had her on Instagram, I didn't really, I'd never put together that she was the oracle from the Me Against the World, right? So when right when she told me that, I was like, wait, what? That that that's that's you? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like right. She went through so many name changes. Yeah, she went through a lot of name changes um, throughout her career. She started Destiny Star, and then she went to, um, you know, uh, Keela. And then she changed the name of, like, the spelling of it. She was Killa. And she did a bunch of rap stuff and, and singing stuff under that name. And then she, you know, she blossomed into the Oracle. She just this being that has this light and not only her voice, but just her whole intellect and, and spiritual side. It's, it's an experience. And that's the, one of the things that I noticed with, with all the people that I worked with, I, you know, I always had her around singing parts and even just to hang and be, you know, morale. But most of the artists, they really remember her because of her spirit and how she, approached them and, and, and it wasn't even much about music, just life and and all of that. She has a really big heart, you know. No, I can most definitely agree with that. She's a very, very yeah. talented very, I had a pleasure pleasure of speaking with her a few times and she's a very, very nice person. You can tell she has a very big heart. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> yep, everybody was calling her mama and stuff. She wasn't even old enough to be nobody mama. <laughs> she's a teenager but there's just the, the spirit I, I I would see her with you know with, with gangsters and, and all that kind of stuff and they all respected her they didn't treat her like you know did some good rat on the block they treated her like oh man that's Keela man she's you know we gotta respect her and she just commanded it just out of the love she would give to everybody and you know, it, it all stems from my parents. You know, my mom, and my dad, they had that kind of love where everybody in the neighborhood wanted to be at our house and and, and be involved in music. And if, even if they couldn't do anything, they would end up being able to do something just because we were all taught to teach. So if somebody would come over and go, I want to see you guys rehearse. And then, you know, three weeks later, they're doing dance steps or they're rapping or singing or something, you know. We just always developed people. And speaking of when you mentioned earlier, you work with tons of different people. Um, a lot, a lot of yeah. people obviously know you from working with Pac and <clears throat> excuse me and whatnot. But you also had the privilege of working with John Mellencamp, singing backup and writing lyrics. What was it like working with him? And how did you and John Mellencamp get connected? Yeah, it was a, a interesting thing because it was right around the time that uh, Tupac had gone to death row. And, you know, I wasn't going to do any music with Death Row. And I just kind of was just wondering what was going to happen. And next thing I know, I get a call from my publisher who was like, hey, what do you think about going out and producing John Mellencamp? And I'm like, what? Oh, oh, OK, 
Okay. And they hooked it up so that I would fly out to Indiana to, to do this work with him. And uh, I was under the assumption I was producing it. So I brought all of my equipment, my Fender Rhodes, my Moog, my SP-1200, my turntables, everything. You know, like I'm going hard on him. Give him everything, bells and whistles. And so when I get there, he's like, um, well, what I brought you here for is to do like some drum loops. And I'm like, oh, that's all? And he's like, yeah, I, I, I was going to get Dr. Dre to do it. And I was calling around and, and, and trying to get him involved with it. And your publisher told me that I should hook up with you. And so I'm like, okay, that's cool. He said, I already had Madonna's uh, producer out here, uh, Junior Vasquez. And I've had Rafael Sadiq out to, to do drum loops, but he ended up just playing bass on two songs. And I'm like, okay. He said, so, you know, if it works, cool. If it doesn't work, it's, it's no problem. It's just, we're having fun, just toying with songs to see what it can do. He said, why did you bring all of this stuff? I said, well, they told me that I was producing you. And they all got a good hearty laugh. And <laughs> he's like, I produce myself, you know. I've done my own records, you know for years and and been recording here since like 85 i'm like oh okay no problem and he said well let me see what you would do with it so he started playing the acoustic guitar and all of the rest of the band guys there surrounding him and trying to figure out what they're going to play and i got my headphones on and i'm getting samples together and all these little things and sampling myself doing certain things and and he was like what do you got going on over there so i played it for him he's like Oh my gosh! He's like, we gotta lay this down. So we started laying it down, and in the midst of it, I started like singing background parts and stuff. And he was like, "Go in there and sing that." Go! Oh my gosh! And just loved it to the point where he was just like, "Do you want to join our band?" And I'm like, "Huh? <laughs> this is weird." I'm coming off of working with Tupac, Spice One, Yo Yo, you know, Radio. I'm doing all this hip hop stuff. And now suddenly I'm thrusted into the rock world and not just on a level where it's like, you know, it's a, it's a new band and we're trying to do this and we're trying to do that. I'm coming in and the first record we do goes platinum. It's like, you know, the, the crowds we're playing for are like extreme. Like it, it would be like sometimes like 70,000 in person and then like, be televised and so it was just like wow this is a whole different energy and um basically I, I stayed in his band for six years and ended up leaving the band and joining the wallflowers for a year that, that's crazy man it just uh i i, I knew you worked with john Mellencamp. i didn't know you actually were in his band that's that's pretty extraordinary man it's kind of yeah, cool, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? You showed at least at least you showed up that day prepared. You know what I mean? You brought all your stuff. And it shows <laughs> you're professional, you know. Over prepared, and <laughs> and I didn't even know like the just because the working relationship we had was was kind of stressful. You know, it wasn't the same experience with Tupac where he trusted Tupac trusted trusted me musically, and Mellencamp was more of a you know over your shoulder, you know, policing every move you made and even to the point of giving you like listen to the rolling stones now play that organ over this you know that kind of thing and we would get into a lot of arguments and and fusses and, and that kind of thing and, and uh I, I after i left the band i probably 15 years dude after i left the band i saw uh, interview that he had done with Reggie Miller when I first joined the band and it's not even two minutes into the interview and he's like so talk about Mosey and he goes okay Mosey this guy is probably the most talented guy to come into my studio except for Bob Dylan and I'm like looking at the screen going huh because you sure he didn't treat us like you know, he didn't treat me like you're a superstar. I really believe in what you're doing. I'm behind you. It was more of a like a, a pressure. You guys suck. 
you know, make me believe it kind of vibe. And, you know, it was just, it was rough. Well, at least you got through it, you know what I mean? Uh, at least you went through, got, made, got through it, you know, you did it. It was a learning experience. Yes, sir. You know? It must have been really it different transitioning different. from hip-hop to, like, rock music. Very different, especially in the approach to the music. Because, you know, mostly I did the music myself when it came to, you know, my production. And I didn't really have anyone to bounce back ideas and discuss things with. But John Mellencamp's band had a band full of producers. Every guy in the band was a producer and played multiple instruments. So the experience there, hearing what John wanted and then being able to talk about how we're going to approach giving him what he wants without even playing it yet. Just talking about the sound, talking about the vibe and the chords and all that kind of stuff. That was a different thing for me. And and I really just, you know, all the engineers that I experienced with John, I, I, I really talked to those guys to, to, to get the sounds and stuff that I want out of everything and really improve my mixes. So I learned a lot in that experience. I'm grateful for it. It just was really rough. <laughs> <laughs> so back to the easier mm. days for you, uh, going back uh, a few years, how did you originally get connected with Tupac? Um, my dude, uh, OG Radio, was signed to Interscope. He was like, he was the first rapper signed to Interscope before any of those guys, before uh, probably around the same time as Tupac. And before, like, you know, No Doubt. And I remember being at Interscope and seeing all these bands coming in, No Doubt, Sublime, Marilyn Manson, like all these people coming in. And I'm like, wow, they, you know, they blew up. But the whole time radio was being held back for some reason. And I know the reason, I'm just not voicing it. <laughs> but he got, he got held back and we kept remaking his album. Like I got put on his album through my guy, Keith Clark, who's a, another Long Beach legend producer. And he had gotten tired of the process. He had been going through with it and asked me, did I want to help out? So I joined in and he kind of faded out and I started doing tracks for radio. And this was like 91, 92. And then about 94, Tupac was, in Interscope and heard John McClain, who was a, a record executive, he heard to, uh, John McClain playing radio songs and was like, who is that? I need to hook up with these guys. I need to hook up, who is that? Told him who it was and he said, who did the music? So told him that I did the music and he wanted me to do some remixes of some of his songs to see how it would work out with me working with him. So uh, that was like on a Wednesday and then probably that weekend, I think it was Friday, we went to the studio and they had uh, Cradle to the Grave, Running from the Police with Biggie on it and Stretch and Lord Knows. And they were like, take these tracks and flip them and so I was like okay and you know it took a couple of nights and I, I flipped it and they overnighted it to Tupac and Tupac was like oh my god he was flipping out he said I gotta work with this dude I gotta work with him and two days later they flew me to New York to work with him so I went to the quad studio and um Basically, he came in and he had the, the, the outlaws, but they was young. They was kids. Like, I think Edie Mean was like 16, 17. The rest of them was like a little younger than that. And they came in and they were all excited and, and they loved Cradle to the Grave. And he was like, man, Cradle to the Grave is going to be on the radio this weekend. And I'm going, oh, are you serious right now? And... He was like, yeah, we love it. It's going to be on the album and everything. So I'm like, wow. And so he said, I heard 
something on those. I had sent him a cassette with a bunch of tracks on it. And it was some tracks that I had done and some tracks that uh, some other guys who were under under my production, I put I sent as well. And at the end of that cassette tape, was this track I had done for R&B singer and sold it to him and everything and he couldn't do anything with it. So he made me give him the money back. And and so Pac had heard it. We had been searching for about an hour looking for this track. And then he played the cassette and I said, oh, wait a minute. I said, dude, that's an R&B track that I did for this singer. And he said, well, it's a rap now, nigga. And I was like, oh, shit, okay, all right, all right. And so we worked on it, and it was outlaw. We worked on it for three hours, and it was done from root of the tutor. Had done a mix on it and everything. And and then I flew back to California, and I, I didn't see him for about six months. And uh, then we started working out in California. We, we just started booking, and we'd be in there constantly just coming up with all kind of stuff and speaking of one of the things there's a lot of talk on the internet um there is, is a um a song that actually supposedly got destroyed um it's called oh. my dying day is there like a clear version out there like or is there still a tape version or is there any masters available with that or is it actually unfortunately gone and we're never going to hear it there is no cassette version and there's possibly the master reel and also a dat of rough mixes of that song that I, that version that I did of that song uh, that my my engineer at the time Paul Arnold he told me because I had a meeting with him maybe about two two years ago maybe no it was a year ago and I had been talking to him for about three years about finding that because everybody I talk to is like where is that and then all the ones I hear online I'm like that's that's not the one I did you know and he said I may have in my storage that the debt of that and quite possibly the real because he's not sure if he left it at the studio or took it but um, I, I don't have a copy of it. Um, when, when that supposedly got destroyed, was that that was the, um, correct me if I'm wrong, that was the fire that happened at, uh, I believe, Universal Studios? Uh, I couldn't tell you. Oh, okay. Because it wasn't supposed to, it wasn't supposed to be there. The, the tape, the tape, we did it at uh, Enterprise. So it should have been at the Enterprise Studio. That's one of the guys who has something to do with Star Trek. He has a studio and he called the Enterprise and he's got, you know, it kind of looks like the Enterprise inside, but um, that's where we did it. And it's actually the last thing. Uh, no, actually, it's the thing right before the last thing I did for, for Pac. Because the other thing I did too, um, there's no copy of that either. I can't find. It's the one he has. Uh, Thug Life and the Outlaws together on it and we tried to get Pop to rap on it while he was in jail over the phone but we had an issue because there was like we, we put a, a phone in the vocal booth and mic'd it and then we mic'd the speaker so that he could hear the music and be able to rap to it but the problem was it was the delay of the music getting to him and then when he rapped it was a delay getting back plus the, the, the delay had the music in it so we couldn't we couldn't like just record it as a delay and then take the tape and flip it and put it in there it was just all jacked up and he was so pissed that you know he, he just yelled out Fuck! real loud and hung up the phone and that was the last I ever talked to him heard from him because yeah. after that he went to death row that's that that's honest i'm 
isn't really the best memory to actually have as a last time, but at least you have memories yeah. of working with him, man. Um, you guys most definitely yeah. put some gems together, man. And before we move on oh, to the from the pop uh, stuff, um, I have one last question for just uh, to that. As you all know, as everybody knows, you got a multi, um, you got, a, you got a, you're a multi platinum producer. You have a platinum plaque from this album. Um, what uh -huh. was it like recording "Me Against the World" with Tupac? What was it like doing that album? It was like uh, it was like uh, a factory. It was so many really good producers on there, and really great engineers, and it was like, you know, Tupac would put his ideas down, and uh, you know, Jimmy Iovine was like the coach, him and Tom Wally, and and they would basically try to find the best songs and, and try to get the right people on the right stuff. So even there were songs that I was involved with that, you know, I didn't get credit for just because I was just there and, you know, trying to help out. Like, um, uh, if I die tonight and, uh, they were mixing that. My engineer was actually mixing that. And I just came to the studio for support and hanging out and, and then uh, it was like, if I die tonight, tonight is the night. If I die tonight. And then I, I went, if we get tonight, tonight, I get in some shit. Like I said that and was just like clowning around. And 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 Paul put it in there. He was like, oh, that would go dope with it. You know, so it was like shouting out little ideas. I would, I would be in some of Mike, Mike Mosley's sessions. Um, I think I went to Hank and... Uh, I mean, uh, oh gosh, what was that? Soul Shock. Those guys, when they were doing Me Against the World, that song, I was there for that. You know, just kind of bouncing around. And at the same time, we were doing fixes on the Thug Life album because, like, they had, they were shooting this video for Shit Don't Stop and they could not find the master to it. And I had just, gone to the studio to hang out Mike Mosley was doing a remix so they could use for the video but um, they wanted it to sound more like you know the album they wanted to have sound like that George Clinton sample and so I you know I, I, I did like some claps or something on there with the clap track and I don't know something on there I, I just messed around with but then I left and went home about 12 in the morning they called me and was like, man, we need you to come back to the studio and do like an official remix of this other version. I'm like, oh, okay. So I drove back and went and just every piece of the sample I recreated, like I played it live. And then, you know, about six in the morning, I went home and a couple of days later, they shot that video. And it's like, it's not the original version that's on the album, but the music completely sounds like it because I recreated it. And like, I was known for doing that kind of stuff. I was able to recreate samples and, and I got a lot of calls to do that kind of stuff. They're not really getting much credit. And, and they never said nothing about it on the single and, or in the video. But, you know, we was just, we were a team just trying to make the best thing that we can make for Park and make him, you know, just have the best quality stuff. That's that's what we were shooting for, and it was no ego. We we wasn't like competing against each other. It was just, you know, yeah. Let's let's just make this album dope. And you know what? At least he had a great team, like have it holding him down when he was in there. You know what I mean? A lot of people would do yeah. scandalous stuff, but you guys straight up was like, look, let's make pop proud. Let's put like, together a masterpiece. That part, that part, and I really had, you know, I had like multiple I was multitasking because you know I had my label Funk House and at the time I had I was getting my artists on his songs like Cradle to the Grave uh Rossell who sang on that he was one of my artists and my big brother of course but you know he's one of my artists and I had my sister and then I had my cousin uh Yada who she sang on also uh, Lord Knows, but she was the main vocal on this version of 
uh, in the late night that that we're talking about. She was doing the yeah na 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 na. She was doing that on on my version. So it was like I was bringing my artist in, and I made sure that that our label got focused on the album cover and all that kind of stuff. And he was really trying to push it so that he would pull all of my artists in under his label, under uh, Out the Gutter. And and when that didn't really work out, he went to death row. Me and his manager and Shock G and my manager, we went to get a deal at Interscope. We was like, screw this, we still getting this deal. So we went in together, me, Shock G, uh, Tupac's manager, Atron, and um, and my manager, Big Tone. And so we had the deal on the table, their artists, Funk House artists, everything was going great. We were about to sign. And then they were like, oh, we can't sign you now. We just gave Dr. Dre 10 million to start Aftermath. Oh. That's so that's why, I, yeah, that's why I was sitting at the crib going, what now? And then it was like, Mellencamp. Oh, oh, okay. Like, might as well roll with it. You know what I mean? Might, might as well. Might as well. <laughs> I, I do want to say, Mo, before we move on from that, man, I'm I'm sorry that that shit happened to you, man. I, I really am. But at least, you know, you got, you got some more platinum records with, with Mellencamp. You know, you got in a band for six mm-hmm. years. So, you know, it's something on the resume. It is. And, and even in the midst of that, I was I was uh, producing New Edition. Uh, I had two songs that I was producing on them for the album Coming Home, but when Puffy got on uh, control of it, he kind of took them songs off, which I'm kind of, one of them I'm really kind of glad he did. It was called Booty Hunt. And if you can just imagine, I had Johnny Gill singing about the booty. I like the booty! You know, it was just like, huh? <laughs> but <laughs> they, them, other, them dudes wanted to sing. It originally started off with Ron DeVoe. I, I did the song for him. I wrote, I wrote it completely. It was like half rap, half sing rap, and you know had this like East Coast kind of track going to it. And uh, when he played it for the other guys, BBD was like, "Oh, we want to do that song." And then next thing you know, it was like New Edition wants to do it, and they took us to the studio to do it. I had to record that crazy song in front of Gerald Levert and Babyface, and they was laughing they ass <laughs> off. I ain't gonna lie. They was laughing. They was like, this song is hilarious, but that's not what I wanted to you know, present to Babyface. Like, oh, hey. I'm a producer. Check this song out. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to sing about the booty hole. <laughs> We're going to sing about the booty Booty hunt. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, Bizarre. You know, but, you know, at least Puffy did one good thing. You know what I mean? At least. Yeah, yeah taking that song off. Exactly. <laughs> so, you, as you mentioned, you are the owner of Funk Town. That's my next question. Uh, Funk Town Records. Funk like, House. Uh, sorry, uh, Funk fu- House. Funk House. Sorry about that. Funk House Records. It's uh, all right. What's the story behind that? What made you decide to create that label? Well, what happened was I, uh, I'm fresh out of high school, and um, I, I'm I'm seeing DJ Slice. He's at you know at VIP uh, record store, and he's like doing tracks for Snoop and like uh radio at the time and um uh what's what's my dude name uh uh what's his name steve yeah. gq steve yeah. gq steve he, he's from Compton, and so he was producing that and, and like i'm just noticing all the hype he got the drum machine and he's doing all of that and um and then i, I ran into my other homie keith clark who's another long beach legend and he's got my dude PDO and well, uh, well at the time he was called uh, Cool P and he had a song he was dissing LL Cool J and everything and he uh, D, uh, Clark brought me to the studio to play bass on the keyboard and so I just sat there and watched like whoa this is crazy I did funk I did like Prince and the time that kind of stuff George Clinton you know, Roger Charlie, I was into the funk. And so experiencing that, 
it was like, wow, I want to get more into drum machines and that kind of thing. And, um, and they had a label called PCA records. And this was in 86. They had this label and I'm like, wow, these young guys who are actually like a year younger than me got a record label. So I went to my pops and I'm like, Hey pops, you know, we want to do this stuff for my sister and, and, uh, and, and my cousin who rapped, who he freestyled. He was like one of the coldest. I was like, we got to do something with this. We didn't just start a label or something. He's like, okay, well, let's, let's, let's start a label. What do you want to call it? Well, at my school, Long Beach Poly, they call it the funk house. My dude, Hank Norman, uh, coined that term, the funk house. And so whenever they play sports and all that stuff, they would throw up the funk. And I was like, this fits perfect with, you know, I love the funk. So we want to call this label Funk House. And he was like, oh, all right, cool. And we just went on from there. We we would do shows in uh, Hollywood, and, and we would get people to come to our shows and perform and, and, and uh, get some notoriety and all that. We had a lot of people that got signed off of doing our shows. Jamie Foxx used to come and do our shows before he got famous. He would come and do his stand-up, and he would, in the middle of it, he would start singing on the piano, and we were like, hey, you can't do that. You're singing better than all of the singers on the show, and you're supposed to be doing comedy, you know. And it was, <laughs> But we just created, we created this atmosphere, and, and Dr. Dre would come and see our shows and, and hang out and, and – um, you know, I got to really just hang with him and, and, and be at his side and see what he'd do. He was working on All in the Same Gang and DOC and, and I mean, Michelle A. He was working on, that, on all that stuff, and I got to sit there and watch it. I mean, it just fueled the fire. Just made it just, you want, and, and want me to do exactly. And I had a guy who, his name is Kenny, Ace Man. And he used to go to my high school, and he said, "Hey, I do I do some like comedy kind of raps, man. I need some tracks. Won't you try to do me some tracks?" And I'm like, "Well, you know, I've never really done hip hop before." And I took George Clinton, "We Want the Funk," and I sampled it, and, and trying to lock it in, but because of the tempo problems, it wouldn't lock properly. So I just replayed everything, and it was like funk over hip hop. And nobody had ever heard that before. And people was tripping out like, whoa, whoa. And I was like, oh, yeah, man, this that z phone. And I started calling it z phone about 86 or something, 85, 86. I started calling it z phone, And um, it just really influenced people. It, it changed to how they started doing their music. And it just, between me, Slice, uh, L.C. Rose, you know, uh, cast like that who's using funk elements. It just created this vibe, which they ended up calling G funk. But you know, I was calling it Z funk from like '86 or so, and um, you know, to me that's what it is. It's just that vibe of of having that fun funk kind of thing over the hip hop. You know, but because we didn't have the same avenue as, you know, other people who did it, they would get credit for it. But really, that sound had been around so long that by the time it actually came out, when they was doing the dog pound and all that stuff, I was so over that sound. I was over it. I started creating all kind of different things to be different on something that I even, you know, was inspired to do as as a youngster. I was just, I was tired of it. I wanted to do something different. So I kept trying to, to make things different, but it was so, so strong in the industry that they just, this, this is what we want you to do. You know, it was tough. So, but also I saw on Facebook uh, recently that you are still producing music. Um, yeah. As we all know, Outlaw Radio has been getting a lot of a lot of heat lately, and I want to try and help, um, you know, you get some 
get some business here. Um, I noticed that uh, you also help you also produce people's projects for for money, obviously. Um, how much oh, yeah. are your fees, and how can one go about getting their music produced by the legendary Mosey MD? Oh, word up. Um, well, I, I have different different packages because you know people with with budgets. You know, I um, I charge a little bit more because. I can really stretch and and give them what they want and and do it comfortably, but um, right now I'm doing like fifteen hundred a track, and uh, and when I say that, I'm not meaning I'm just gonna do some music and I'm gonna send it to 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 the person and and they're gonna just do whatever they want to do with it and they're not gonna register it and they're not gonna do you know the right things with it. I don't mean that. I mean, like, actually produce it. I mean, I, I want to have input on what goes on it and help you grow because I have, like, 35 years' experience in creating songs and music, and so I would really have a lot to to give in helping, you know, develop the, the, the right shit because, you know, Pac knew. When I worked with him, he listened to me. He was like... What, what, how do you feel about this? What should I do? You know, and I coached him. And that's what a producer does. So that's what that entails. I, I do make deals according to, you know, people's situation. I, I'm not like, I'm not a monster, you know, but I, if, if you're going to get quality work from me, you, you, you know, you have to pay for that. And so just hit me up. You can hit me up on Facebook, L Maurice Stewart. That's L Maurice Stewart. Or you can hit me up on Instagram, Mosey Star. And uh, let's conversate. We can we can get some things happening. Right now, I, I'm trying to put together, finish putting together this Morris Day album. Me and Snoop is uh, working with his own Snoop's label. And um, I have probably nine songs on the album, and we've been promoting one of them lately. It's called Lil Mo Funk. You can get that on iTunes and all that sort of things, and it's also on uh, YouTube. And so I wrote and produced that, and it features Snoop on it. It's Morris Day featuring Snoop, Lil Mo Funk. And uh, so I'm working on that as well as new songs for him, and a couple of other projects. I, I have artists, so I'm trying to put together a big package so that we can get this material out and uh, staying busy, staying busy. I'm trying to be daddy at the same time. It's, you know, it's, it's hard to, to juggle them both, but, um, you know, and you know what? I I'm a workaholic. Say, most definitely. I got to say to the people listening, 1500 bucks, Mosey MD. You know, hit them up if you got the money. Straight up, I'm telling you, um, as a fan of his work, you guys, if you're an artist, you need to get your music produced by him. Multi-platinum producer. Not one plaque, but multiple plaques. 1500 is a great, great price to get quality yes. work. If I was an artist, yes. I ain't going to lie to you. I'd be hustling to get that 1500 <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That's the smart thing. You don't want a shortcut. Like, there's a lot of people who want a shortcut on the music side because they feel like, you know, it's just music, and I, I can, I'm good over anything. But, but what you don't realize is because there's so many songs that are out that are not produced that has really good music, you're not going to enjoy that music in the next couple of years. You're just going to be like, oh, yeah, I remember that song. Yeah. And and the reason why Tupac songs are still memorable 25 years later is because he had, especially the Me Against the World album, a team of special producers and engineers and people really thinking about making the best product out of the songs. That's what you had then. But these days, everybody wants to cut corners the labels are, are scared of uh, putting money into things, so they just, anybody who got a lot of views, 
you know, they, oh yeah, we, they got a lot of views, we'll sign them, but not realizing that, that that just don't really last with all the, the gimmicks and everything. You can't just be gimmicky and expect your record to sell for 20 years. That's true. It won't happen. And speaking of something lasting 20 years from now, you recently were on The Late Show with Jimmy Kimmel. Um, and yes. I already know that's a history-making moment for you and the rest of the Morris, uh, Morris Day band, but what was that experience like, and how did you land the Jimmy Kimmel show? And I have to say, before we get into this, I watched you on Jimmy Kimmel, man. You guys killed it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you welcome, yeah. Man. Well, you know, really, um, it was a great experience for me because I have been on many of those late night shows. I, I think I even did the Kim Jimmy Kimmel show with the Wallflowers, uh, if I remember correctly. But um, ha being able to perform a song on TV that you wrote and produced, and then you got two legends <laughs> doing it. It's like, wow. And then it went further because I was able to get my girl, my sister, and my good friend who I'm, I've been his mentor for many years. He's from Indiana. And uh, he lives in California, but to have all those guys be accepted and being a part of this was super exciting. I mean, Morris, like, he still talks about it. He's like, I love my, my band, but I love my new band, and that just makes me feel good because it's family, and it's one guy who I grew up wanting to be, and then another guy who I grew up with you know, Snoop. So it's just like, wow, dude, to be able to do that was just ridiculous. And I see when I, uh, th this past summer, I didn't get a chance to see, um, to see Morris Day live, but I saw Snoop live and I know that that guy puts on one hell of a show. Like when you see mm -hmm. Snoop in concert, it's everything you expect it to be plus 10 times more. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like that guy is all out. He's a showman. And you know what's crazy? You're going to crack up. What, like when I first met Snoop, he was in the sixth grade. And I was like in the eighth or ninth grade. I think I was in ninth grade. And we used to play basketball together all the time on the on the court. And, and it was exactly the same way. He was. He just had this personality that all the little girls, Snoopy, Snoopy. <laughs> and all the little... What's Snoop at? What, you know, everybody wanted to hang around. He was all super tall. He called me old ass Mo because I was I was older than them, but I was always shorter. Did he have the big ass afro back back in grade school as well? No, no, he had the short haircut going in. It was all low. It was low low haircut. He didn't really start doing that until he started like you know making records with Death Row, and he started growing his hair like that. That's pretty cool. But before that, before that, man, he was he was DJ Slice's dude, man, and 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 Slice had some cold tracks for him, and I just remember being envious. I mean, they had Thin Line Records, and and I remember just seeing them, and they would they had dancers, and they was just cold, like wow, man, this is, mm. if if people could hear this, they would just love it, and it, you know, it's just too bad that Slice didn't get the 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 just that he should have got because he really developed Snoop. Yeah, and I remember I think um, also DJ Slice's um, record store, I believe Snoop Dogg did the uh, don't quote me if I'm yeah, wrong, but the well, Who Am I, What's My Name music video on the roof. Yeah, that was uh, it, it belonged, the store belonged to Calvin. Calvin um, uh, what's Calvin's last name? Oh my gosh. I can't think of his last name right now. I'm drawing a blank, but he's owned VIP him and his brother. His brother has another store that's like in, inside of Compton. But check this out. Everybody who did records from, if they wasn't from California and they wanted their stuff played in California, they had to go through VIP. Whether it was hip hop, gospel, uh, R&B. Like we, they'd have days where these guys would come to the VIP. Today is going to be Atlantic Star. And we're like, what? And we go to Atlantic Star, and we see them. And next thing you know, they're, like, getting their play out in California. 
Calvin had a really big hand in that. So that's why he was developing artists because he felt like I can push these artists through myself with my connects. So he started developing these, these artists. I remember Biggie came there. I mean, before he even blew up Craig Mack. Uh, oh gosh, everybody. I met uh, Curtis Blow there when I was young. Like everybody had to go there. So that's why it's such a, uh, that's why he was on top of the VIP in that video. For people on the West Coast, they really know that, you know, they knew at that time anyway, they knew that that was the deal. That people had to go through VIP and, and stores like that, the mom and pops out there in the West. And you know what? Um, so you also have, what well, people might not know this, but Moe's DMD, March 7th, 2016, so we're jumping quite a few years up the timeline here. Um, uh, you, you released an album called Soul Finger. Uh, what's the uh -huh. inspiration behind that record, and where can our listeners buy a copy? Well, the the inspiration, um, the inspiration came from really my dad, because he was just noticing a lot of things missing in records these days. So I would try to capitalize. Uh, on those areas and those particular songs I really did to to make my dad smile and, and go, yeah, now that's the kind of stuff that needs to be around. And initially, I dropped it in 2016. I pulled it back because I um, I wanted to change some of the songs on there. And so I re-released it um, 2018, I think I did, and then I I ended up having to pull back again, and this was my own doing because I wanted I want to promote it right. I don't want to just put it out there and just it's just sitting there. I want to get money behind it and shoot some more videos and be able to do some shows so I could promote it right. And so I just pulled it back for a second and, until I get some more things happening so I can generate some more money. But I'm going to re-release it, um, if not to, uh, if not uh, 2020, it'll be 2021. So this is but the last... It's... Oh, sorry about that. No, go ahead. Oh, okay, I was going to say, so this is the last question I have for you tonight. Um, okay. Uh, what's some good advice that you can actually give some up-and-coming inspiring producers? Okay, um, there's a lot, and I can probably speak for hours on it, but uh, just to shorten it, I would definitely say to make sure that you have all of your avenues together where you're making money after the fact. Like, let's say you get some money in the beginning to, to give somebody for a track, and then they release it. Well, if they're making money off of it, you should too, because you compose the music. So make sure that you're doing your publishing splits and you have your publishing company with ASCAP or BMI or um, I forgot the name of the, there's three publishing uh, companies that can track your money whenever you get, it's supposed to get paid for doing certain things that's the first thing the second thing is um really work to get the best you can get out of your songs not just the music but lyrics uh performance um you know mix everything you want everything to be on point you could it's hit and miss but as long as you try to get the best you're going to always stand out more than someone else because you're doing something that's in your own lane you're not copying someone you're creating your own vibe and then when you're able to get those songs out you're able to get your money back from the sales um those are the two biggest things 
and really just keep your ego in check. It's really about getting the best music. It's not about who's the best producer or who has the best tracks. Um, you, cause even after all is said and done, what really matters is, is your publishing coming in? Are you getting paid for these, these tracks year by year if they're being sold? And, uh, just, just make sure your business is straight. And, that's and don't give up. Most definitely. That's some great advice. Uh, you know, co especially coming from a legendary individual like yourself. That's some really, really great advice. And, Mosey, what's next for you? Anything uh, anything else left on the agenda? Any, any more late night, uh, sorry, appearances at all? Yeah, we're going to do more appearances. Um, as we, because we're going to do more promotion on this song, Lil Mo Funk. And then we're going to drop some more singles. Uh, he has songs that we're going to have, like, pull on uh, LL Cool J, you know, to, to keep it interesting with the, the funk, but kind of bringing it up to a new vibe. And it's not going to start with Morris Day. I continuously do it all the time. It's, it's, it's always somebody. Um, I, was, I was one of Michael Jackson's producers right before he died. And uh, never got, never got to get anything out. But yeah, from uh, 2009 or no, 2008 to, to to up until he died, I was working on a song for him when he died. Yeah. And um, you know, it just it it doesn't stop. So there's gonna always be something, whether it be my artist or you know a, a new project. But I know that I'm involved with the time with Morris Day in the time right now and you know that's kind of where I'm living at right now but I'm always doing more stuff my hands and everything <laughs> <laughs> but actually if you don't mind um, I actually did not know you work with Michael Jackson would you be able to like uh, just uh, enlighten us a little bit like what was Michael Jackson like in the studio Michael is like he's he's brilliant and he's quiet he wants to see what you got but at the same time, he's he has his ideas and and it and it works like you know he he's he's very smart you know he's been doing records since sixty nine maybe sixty nine seventy but old Jackson um, five. <laughs> Jack yeah and he's learned from the best Stevie Wonder Marvin Gaye Smokey Robinson you know he know how to put songs together. And so that was a, a interesting experience. I only got to work one time in person, and I was living in Indiana, so I, I came back and I uh, did did my music here, and I did songs, I did tracks, I did collabs with uh, Dr. Freeze, which is how I got involved with it. Me and Dr. Freeze. Do you know who Dr. Freeze is? Uh, not fully, no. I heard of the name though. Do you remember the uh, song uh, Poison, BBD? Yes, I remember that track. Spider-Man and Freeze in full effect. Yeah, that was uh, Dr. Freeze and Spider-Man who did that. And he also did uh, I Wanna Sex You Up. He did that for Color Me Bad. And he did uh, Break a Dawn for Michael Jackson. And so me and Freeze were we had the same manager. And so um, he talked us into doing a project together called Track Man and Robin. I was Track Man and he was Robin. And so we was working on this project and we were gonna come out under Ruthless Records, under uh, Easy es wife, you know, direction or whatnot. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of that, in the middle, like we did about eight, nine songs and then Michael called Freeze and was like, hey, you know, I want to do some more songs with you. He said, hey, what do you think about getting Mo Z to work on it? And he's like, you know, flew me out there and out to Vegas and, um, you know, had a meeting and everything. And, and we talked about it. I can't talk too much about it because I'm, I'm under a $10 million confidentiality contract. Yeah, you don't want to mess that up. <laughs> you don't want to. <laughs> no. I only got ten. I ain't got ten million hanging around. 
uh, new. And I don't, I do not want to be that person that no, <laughs> you know what I mean. We'll just say you had a, we'll just say Mosey MD had a meeting with Jackson, and we'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, sir. I thought that was my, I thought that was my back. I'm back. You know, at that moment, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm back now. And and then he died. So I was like, you know what? I gotta move back to California and try to catch up with Snoop. And so that's what I did. I moved back out there to California. And in the midst of trying to catch up with Snoop, I ran into Lil Half Dead. And uh, I was like, hey, I need you to take these tracks I got for Snoop and for Dr. Dre and get it to him. And he was like, oh, all right, all right. And then he listened to him. He said, nah, bruh, I'm, I'm not giving this to Snoop. And I'm not giving this to Dr. Dre. I want this on my album. And I'm like, oh, oh, okay. Cool. <laughs> and, and so the songs, the tracks that I had for Snoop, and I had did uh, a hook and a track and a verse for Dr. Dre. I had written his verse and everything. And uh, he heard that and was like, nah. Now I'm gonna do this one, and so he ended up doing Dr. Dre's verse, and 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 I'm on the hook, and then I said, you know what, I gotta rap on this mug too, so I rapped on the second verse, and then I got RBX to bring up the end, and he rapped on the end of it, so that was a cool cut, and I ended up working on that whole album, um, Dead Serious, of Little Half Dead. Then he felt comfortable enough. Then he felt comfortable enough to get me back with Snoop. <laughs> right around, right around the time that Snoop was doing the the Snoop Lion, the reggae oh, album. Oh God, yeah. I love Snoop. I love Snoop. Just all I'm gonna say is, I like Snoop Dogg better. <laughs> but you know, he, he was good though. Like I, I listen to the reggae album, but it's like you know, from a from a fan standpoint. Uh, and I, I'm not I'm, I'm not dissing him or nothing. Like everyone tries new things right. in their career. I just it just everyone knew him as Snoop Dogg. Then you heard the Snoop line. And it's like, okay, I, I I see what you did here, but please rap mm -hmm. again. Please, we need your we need Snoop Dogg back. <laughs> you know. Yeah, and you don't even know. In right in the middle of making that album, he gave up on it. Like he stopped calling himself Snoop Lion and everything before the album even came out, because he went down there to to Jamaica to make the record, and. And we wanted to, you know, get with Bob, Bob, uh, Bob Marley's people and all the uh, different people like that. And before they even got to record, they pulled him to the side. Hey, so you're not messing up our culture, are you? Are you not making fun of us? What are you doing? Like, you know, that kind of thing. And he understood it, but the fact that everybody was doing that to him, he was like, okay, I'm think I'm about over this. I'm just going to go back to, you know, rapping, but he, he had to, you know, put the album out. But he was done. Everybody was going Snoop Lion and all this stuff. He was already back to Snoop Dogg, working on other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's just funny, though, because, like, I, I like Snoop for that reason, you know. Uh -huh. He tries a little bit of everything, you know. Like, he cooked with Martha Stewart, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm pretty sure the food uh -huh. never made it to the customers, but you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, he tried a little bit of everything. I, I like Snoop Dogg, man. He tried a little bit of everything, and at least he's trying. A lot of these artists, they want to be the same for years. At least he's like, you know what, I'm going to spice it up. I'm going to try this. Well, Snoop learned real early that you can't live forever off of the music business. You got to put your, that, and that's another thing I guess I should tell producers, too, and this goes for artists as well. You can get to a certain level of fame and money, and it will go away just that fast. So you have to be able to invest into other things where you continuously making your money. And if you do music, it'll be something that you could afford to do. You, you're not going to be like, gosh, I went into debt making this album because you you got your money in other things. And Snoop, he does everything. When I, I talked to him, I said, dude, you're the hardest working dude I know in the industry. I don't know anybody that raps continuously, got artists, he does movies, he does TV shows, he does appearances, he DJs, 
clubs. He, I mean, everything, everything. And you got to do that. You got to just be versatile enough to just keep keep it going. Exactly. Um, so, Mo, uh, Mosey, this is the time in the interview that I give the chance for the person that comes on the show, a chance to give uh, shout-outs to whomever they want to give shout-outs to. And also their social oh, media and also their social media handles. That way uh, our listeners can follow you on social media if they're not already doing that. Sure enough. Definitely. Well I, um as far as the, the social media stuff, you can hit on uh, Instagram, Mosey Star, M O E Z Star. And you can hit me on Facebook. They made me use my real name, L Maurice Stewart. And um as far as shout out, I would definitely want to give a big shout out to Long Beach and uh, everybody that has had something to do with the positivity and the unity of Long Beach and our music and our culture. Uh, I, I give shout out to everybody that's on that and not trying to destroy our our whole situation um i want to give a shout out to all the un- unsung producers out there uh especially long beach but anywhere else you putting in your work you, you're going hard and you're not getting the attention you need just understand all it is is get you a publicist that's all it is it doesn't mean you're not good it doesn't mean that people are not feeling you. You haven't reached out to the right people yet. And get your publicist and, you know, you can handle it that way. I want to give a shout out to my sister, Keela. Keep up the faith. Keep it going. You can do this. I'm glad to have you back in this music thing. She sat out for a long time. God had her on a whole different mission and she's ready to do it now. I want to give a shout out to my girl, Tiff. She's got a, a musical future coming too, not just with the time, but like she's got her own songs and 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 we're creating a project for her. I want to give a shout out to all my artists on Funk House. Love y'all. Yeah, Macalicious, Greenleaf, uh, Freestyle. Um, gosh, too many to name. I got like forty artists, but love y'all, man. We're gonna do this. <laughs> we're gonna do this. And I, def- I want to give one more shout out, and and that's to the homie Dr. Dre. I I ain't seen him in a long time. I ain't talked to him in a long time. And um, you know, regardless of this music thing, whatever, he's still my bro. And uh, keep up the good work, man. We we all believe in you, and 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 we believe in your work. And and forget about all of the 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 negative talk, man. It's all to the good. So we'll always get that. And, and, you know, pretty much that's it. My kids, I love all my kids, my five, my, my, my starting five, and my grandbaby. I think that's it. I always forget people. That's all good, you know what I mean? I'm pretty sure they all know Mo- that you're thinking of them, man. Um, I want to say, mm-hmm. Mosey, thank you so much for coming up on Outlaw Radio Live and providing Absolutely. us with an, with an over an hour of your time, man. Um, I, I want to say on behalf of myself, um, and the rest of our the fans as well. Thank you so much for your contribution to music, man. Your people uh, people always think about the artists, man. Just the people that uh-huh. just did the record. They forget about who's in the background, who makes the music. And you know, Me Against the World was. One oh, that's of those when you know records. you do it right. Yeah, and Me Against the World, man, was one of those records. And I told you this before we went live, but I got to say it again. Really did help me through a lot, and I mean a lot of my hard times, man. So I physically feel without that record, awesome. we wouldn't be speaking today. So thank you so much for that contribution to hip hop. Thank you. Awesome, man. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm, I'm just glad to be able to pull what's in my heart, and other people feel it too. Thank you so much, Maurice. You have yourself a wonderful night. If you need anything, we have each other on Facebook. So I'm only a message away. I got you. That part. <laughs> Thank you very All right, much. man. Thanks for having me on, brother. I appreciate you. You're most certainly welcome, man. You have yourself a wonderful night. And if we don't talk before Christmas, you and your family have a wonderful Christmas. Thank you. You too. Absolutely. <laughs>